Well, good morning, Selby United Church, and welcome to this time of worship for April 14th, 2024. Welcome to each and every one of you who have gathered in the sanctuary this morning. We are blessed by your presence here today, and welcome to all who are joining us online this morning or later on in the week. We're glad that you're with us as well. This morning, we're thinking about the challenge of actually living as people of the light. We'd like to be children of light, wouldn't we? We'd like to be pure and clean and and a bright light for all the world to see. And yet so often in the church, things get kind of smoky. Why is that? Why, if we are apparently God's chosen people, do we so often struggle with our high calling? Well, here's some good news. Jesus once said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I have not come for the righteous, but for sinners. Sinners like me and you. Does that change things a little bit? We're not here because we've got it all sorted out. We're here because he's sorting us out. The church is not a gathering of the perfect. It's a gathering of people who know We need a savior. We're people who know that resurrection is the end of the story. So welcome to this imperfect gathering of people celebrating this profoundly good news that we have a savior for people just like us. Let's stand together as we begin our time of worship singing, come, now is the time to worship. be seated. I appreciate the line in that song, come just as you are before your God. But God doesn't simply call us to come and and be as we are, but, but he sends his Holy Spirit in the midst of this amazing gathering to transform us into the people we can be. This morning, God wants to accomplish something in you. Are you ready? Are you prepared for the transformation of heart and mind that he is going to accomplish this day? Well, we better begin this time by coming into God's presence and opening our time with prayer. Will you pray with me? Holy One, this morning we just think about you, but we want to encounter you. We want you to put in us a clean heart, a clean conscience, 
and a clean mind. We want you to come by your spirit today and teach us, correct us, and renew us in your mission. Thank you for gathering us today. And may our time together strengthen and sustain us for our days lived in a world of hurt. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Well, over the coming weeks and months, uh, a number of our special musicians are going to join together in various trios and duets to share their special music with us. And this morning, we're so pleased that Bernice and Louise and Doug are the first to share their gift of music in a trio this morning. Approximately 10 years ago, the Putnam family moved into our community to serve as minister for Selby Empey Hill Church. At that time, we were just going along trying to make ends meet. Well, look at us today. <laughs> Louise picked this song, and it fits so well that the three of us decided to dedicate it to the glory of God and to the Putnam family, our appreciation. Let's join in a loud clap of appreciation. For that. God took care of ourselves by giving us a very talented minister and a very talented musician. This song is entitled, God Will Take Care of Me. Be not dismayed, but God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all
Thank you so much, guys. That was a beautiful, beautiful and touching song. I'm going to invite our young folks to come and join me here in the first couple of pews. Come on down. <laughs> and Merle is already here. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Hey, do you guys ever burn a candle in your house? Do you ever have candles? Yeah? What's good about a candle? What do, what do you like about a candle, Grace? Yeah, if you have like a scented candle, it makes the house smell good. What else is good about candles? Yeah? Uh, it lights up your house. Yeah, it gives you like a warm light and it can be kind of a nice feeling to have that warm flickering candle in your house. What else is nice about a candle? Anything else you can think that's nice about a candle? They look nice, they smell nice. What else? Yeah? They're bright. They're bright, you're right. Well, Jesus says that we're kind of like a candle. Are you like a candle? <laughs> We're kind of like a candle because his light can shine through us in the world. But he says that there's sometimes problems with candles, and I have some candles here, and I want you to tell me, is this candle going to burn really, really well? No. Why not? Because it's all the way down in the bottom. It's already, like, sunk down, and when we, when we light this candle, all the wax is going to collect in that little hole, and it'll probably put itself out, right? So that's, that's not a great candle. Uh, how about... This one. Is this, a, is this a super awesome candle? No. <laughs> I'm getting mixed reviews here. Why isn't this one a good one? Okay, so like, like there's not enough of a wick, right? Like it's just like a little stub. It probably can't light it, and if you do light it, it won't stay lit very long. Yeah, you're right. Okay, what about this one? What about this one? Is this a good candle? Yeah? That's a good candle? You think, is that a good candle? Yeah? You're happy with that one? You know what? I actually think this wick is a bit too long. Because you know what happens when the wick is too long? It just makes a lot of smoke. It just, it just burns, and, and, you get, and the whole room smells with smoke. And then your mom says, go blow out that candle. It's filling the house with smoke. Could that happen? But then the, the fire thing will go off. The fire thing will go off. And you, do, you have a, do you have a sprinkler system in your house? <laughs> Jesus makes us a promise this morning. So last week he made us a promise. Do you remember the promise last week? Remember I had the reed? And what did, promise, what did Jesus promise, Piper? Uh, that he would come back whenever. <laughs> that he would come back whenever? That's actually a promise we talked about at Cornerstone. So you're right. He did promise to come back whenever. <laughs> but last week at Sunday school, or last week at church, I had a reed. And I said, Jesus made a promise about a reed. Never. Do you remember what the promise was about a reed? break a reed? Yeah, he said, a bruised reed I will never break, right? And so when we're feeling hurt or broken, he are, when, it, when we're feeling like, our, like things aren't going very well, Jesus says, I will never break a bruised reed. Because what a reed's worth? Not very much. But he says, you are precious to me. You are not like a, a reed out in the ditch. You are precious to me. Well, this morning Jesus says, a smoking candle I will not put out. A smoking candle I will not put out. What does that mean? Well, if we're candles and we're supposed to show forth God's light, sometimes we make smoke too. Sometimes, and we talked about this at Cornerstone, and you guys are remarkably honest, sometimes we tell lies. Raise your hand if you ever tell a lie. <laughs> See what I mean? They're really honest. <laughs> uh, it's be, raise your hand if you ever mean to a friend. <laughs> uh, raise your hand if you um, ever do something your mom says you shouldn't do. <laughs> sometimes we do these things that we're not supposed to do right sometimes we do things that we that we know we shouldn't do and that makes smoke but jesus says even though you, you're not perfect even though you do things you know you're not supposed to do i'm still working on you you're still my project i'm still making you into the person that you will one day be because of what jesus will do for each and every one of us smoking flax or smoking wick he will not put out. What was the first promise that we had last week? Uh, he will never break a bruised reed. A bruised reed he will never break. And today, what's the promise today? He will never put out. A smoking candle he will never put out. How are these kids smart? <laughs> Let's stand up and sing our hymn for the young at heart.
seated. So this morning is week two of our meek and lowly sermon series where we're thinking about the kind of Savior that we have. In this series, we're essentially getting to the very heart of the gospel. Why do we need a Savior? Because of the sin in us is too big of a challenge for us to solve on our own because we need a solution from outside of us. But what happens when things get a little smoky? Well, let's listen now to the Word of God that comes to us through the voice of Jill Story. I'm reading Matthew 12, uh, 15 to 21. God's chosen servant. When Jesus heard about the plot against him, he went away from that place, and large crowds followed him. He healed all the sick and gave, him, and gave them orders not to tell others about him. He did so as to make come true what God had said through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant, whom I, who, whom I have chosen, the one I love, and with whom I am pleased. I will send my spirit upon him, and he will announce my judgment to the nations. He will not argue or shout or make loud speeches in the streets. He will not break off a bent reed nor put out a flickering lamp. He will persist until he causes justice to triumph. And on him, all people will put their hope. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Jill. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come so that we might hear what you have for us today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever met a Christian you didn't like? Of course you have, right? But aren't we all supposed to be changed, improved, a whole new version of you because of our faith? Haven't we been born again? Haven't we been clothed in righteousness? Isn't it an out with the old, in with the new kind of thing? Shouldn't we Christians really be the most likable people in the world? Mahatma Gandhi once famously said, I, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. You Christians are so unlike your Christ. That's a big problem in the church, isn't it? Hypocrisy is one of the world's biggest complaints about us. People find church people to be kind of not very much like the person we claim to follow at all. In fact, there, there are all kinds of TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook jokes about how bad Christians can sometimes be. Saturday Night Live famously picked on the church lady. At times, we're known for being downright terrible. And it's not only that we're sometimes gossipy, judgy, moralistic. Christians have been accused of some very horrendous atrocities throughout history. A historian once looked into the cost of Christians behaving badly, studying such events as the Crusades, a so-called holy war, the Reformation, where those who disagreed were burned at the stake, witch trials in Salem, New Hampshire, and so on and so forth. And he found that under Christian regimes, about 200,000 people have been killed over a 500-year period. That's shocking when you consider that we Christians claim to follow a guy who taught us that you should love your enemies and you should pray for those who persecute you. In our time, atheists like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens have argued that religion is the problem, that, that if you get rid of religion, the world would be a better place. But, but is that true? What happens when religion isn't moderating behavior? Do, do people become nicer, less judgy, less gossipy, less murdery? Well, again, a historian looked into it, and, and over the last 100 years, uh, purely atheistic regimes have killed 100 million people. So the facts on the ground say differently. 
But nonetheless, we, we can't hide the fact that, that Christians regularly behave badly, and, and if you hold us to our own standards, we don't get a very good grade. But wait, is, is that what a Christian is? Is a Christian someone who, who doesn't have to worry about struggling with, with sin or, or evil or doing the wrong thing? No, a, a Christian is someone who knows that they have a sin problem and they recognize their need for a savior. And the funny thing is that, that most of the New Testament is made up of letters addressed to Christians who behaved badly. If the early church was perfect, why did the Apostle Paul have to write all of those letters of correction? Why wasn't he just writing saying, hey guys, great job out there, keep doing what you're doing? But the fact is that sin in the followers of Jesus has been a problem from the very beginning. You remember that time when the kids showed up? Hey, you kids, get out of here. This isn't for you. We want a nice, quiet gathering here. What's that, Jesus? Uh, are you sure? Get, get the kids up here. We want them right up at the front. <laughs> you remember that time that the evangelistic mission went really badly? And James and John thought they had a solution? Jesus, do you want us to just call down fire from heaven? We can wipe them all out. You remember the time that Peter said, nope, never heard of them. Jesus, uh, Jesus, Jesus, uh, no, it doesn't ring any bells. Yeah, I know I have a Galilean accent, but, but it's a big place. I don't know everybody. See, from the very beginning, Jesus has a bit of a problem with the people who claim to follow him. I'm not sure if that's an encouragement to us this morning, but but it seems to be the way things are. But let's not forget that Christians also do truly amazing things. All through history, the followers of Jesus, who were, were the first ones to consistently suffer for others, to, to give sacrificially, to lead the way to peace, to, to look after the least and the last and the lowly. So often, Christians working on the, the front lines of the most difficult circumstances in the world are having the greatest impact. But sadly, that's not a very titillating uh, headline in the news. We like to hear it when we get it wrong, when, when someone messes it up. But the reality is that sometimes we do live up to our own bad press. Sometimes we still act like people who do not live in light of the resurrection. And sometimes sin and hatred runs deep in us, and we just get it all wrong. But again, that's why we need a savior. But this morning we can take heart because Jesus has yet another promise for us, revealing what kind of savior we are dealing with. This morning, Matthew tells us that the, the servant prophecy from way back in Isaiah that we heard last week is actually all about Jesus. And he is not surprised about his family's sin problem. A smoldering wick I will not snuff out. What does that mean? What's a smoldering wick? Well, think of one of those ancient lamps with the oil in it, and there's a wick made of linen that you would light. And when it burns, it produces a nice clean light to fill the room. But sometimes it just won't burn properly. It smolders and makes more smoke than light. In other words, Jesus knows that his church at times is going to be kind of smoky. Sometimes Jesus isn't going to be so proud of his little city on a hill. Sometimes we're going to get it wrong. I've told you before that my call to ministry came in the midst of the worst church conflict I had ever experienced. There was a little group of people in a lovely church that Andrea and I attended when we were first married who decided that the minister that would just been hired was no good at all, and he had to go. But they didn't have a lot on him, so they started making stuff up. They gossiped and spread rumors and complaints, and, and they withheld their offering, and it, eventually it came to a head, and the presbytery was called in, and a review was had, and the minister left, and people were ordered to apologize for their bad behavior, and 
Well, we left because we didn't need that in our lives. And yet in watching that minister who was under attack face those lies and, and the evil so faithfully, I realized that this church thing must really matter. Sure, the church isn't perfect. In fact, sometimes it's downright smoky. But it's still the bride of Christ. It's still his body here on earth. And Jesus seems to know that smoky believers is part of the deal. But here's the thing. Hypocrisy in believers doesn't actually undermine the gospel. In fact, in a sense, it justifies it. We need a Savior. If we could just learn to all get along all the time, be a little bit nicer, well, you don't need Jesus. You just need to learn to be nicer. But my experience says we need Jesus. Richard Sibbs, the Puritan pastor from the 1600s, says, in God's children, especially in their first conversion, there is but a little measure of grace, and that little mixed with much corruption, which as smoke is offensive, but that Christ will not quench a smoking flax. And that's the thing, isn't it? The, the church is filled with people of different stages of maturity. There's babes, there's toddlers, there's young people, there's mature adults, and I'm not talking about their age. And I'm not talking about how long they've come to church. I'm talking about what the Holy Spirit is doing in each one of our hearts. Some people seem to burn so bright. Some people fill the place with smoke. We're all Christians. We're all saved by grace. Because our citizenship in heaven isn't earned by our good deeds. It's earned for us by Jesus and his good deeds. So here's some good news. At times, we will surprise ourselves with how smoky we are. At times, we will feel shame for the things that we have thought and said and, and done. But Jesus wants you to know that your value is not who you are today. It's not that you're going to measure your good deeds against your bad ones and do some heavenly accounting and hopefully it works out somehow. No, your value is in who he is making you into, who you will one day be. Who will you one day be? Perfect. One day there will be no sin in you. You will, won't need to apologize for losing your temper anymore. You won't need to avoid that person in the grocery store because of what happened way back when. You won't need to avoid that group of people because of what they know about you. One day you will be perfect. But today's not that day, is it? <laughs> and so Jesus says to you, a smoldering wick I will not put out because he's already at work on you to make you so much more than you are. Sibs says that nothing in this world is of so good use as the least grain of grace. If you're here today, I have to believe it's because God is at work in your heart. I'm not sure where he is in that building project. Maybe in this moment he is tearing something down. Maybe he's framing something up. Maybe he's touching up the paint. I don't know. But if you're here, he's doing something in you. But until heaven, each one of us will always, every day, have a double principle at work inside of us. There is grace, rest assured. But there is also nature. And sometimes our nature gets real smoky. But the seed of grace that is in you is from heaven, a gift from God that will be kindled by God's Spirit over time. You can't do it yourself. You ever try to make a campfire in the pouring rain? That's what it's like when you try to kindle your own 
goodness within you. It gets smoky and wet and gross. But God's Spirit will will do it. He will make a pure, clean light within us in time. But what is God's purpose in letting us remain smoky? Why not just zap us all and, and the sin falls away and we can show forth our loveliness to all the world? Well, what if that sin has a purpose? What if God is using the sin in me and the sin in you to to breed our humility, to magnify His love, to show forth His power to overcome the sin that we can't seem to deal with ourselves? Can we become perfect in this lifetime? Have you ever met someone that you thought to yourself, that person is a saint. They're perfect. You know, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, used to believe in something called Christian perfection. He he believed that if people lived a certain way, tried really hard, put certain boundaries on their lives, that they could achieve perfection. But he changed his mind about that. Why? I think because he hung around people long enough. Even the best sorts of people. In his journal, he would often speak of one of his favorite saints, Sarah Ryan, and he often referred to her as one without equal in all of England. And he often wrote of her using the highest terms of Christian affection and esteem. But 15 years later, he refers, he makes this entry in his journal. He says, for some time I have been convinced it was my duty to tell her what was on my mind. She appears to be above instruction. I mean, instruction from from men. You you appear to think that that none understands the doctrine of sanctification like she does. She appears to undervalue the experience of almost everyone else in comparison to her own experience. There were a number of other people in Wesley's societies that he once nearly thought were perfect. Uh, A lady named Jeannie Keith, a, a lady that he called Holy Mary, his own brother Charles. So so why do Christians never seem to reach perfection? Why does God just not zap the the sin in us and show forth our glorious selves to all the world? The answer is because he's gentle. Because he's lowly. Because God will be more glorified when the Holy Spirit does a great work in us. Because living in a sin-sick world, it's not possible to deal with sin on a kind of micro level, in, a, in one heart at a time. It, it spreads, it's contagious, it, 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 it just gets smoky in all the room. It's deep, it's generational. We're dealing with something here that is way bigger than you or me trying a little harder. And the wages of sin is death. And so by the Holy Spirit, God begins a gentle work, pumping in the antivirals, tending to the wounds of sin here and there and everywhere. And so the Holy Spirit continues this slow and uneven work in all of us. Sometimes we're burning pretty bright and we think, I've made it, I've done it, I'm good. And then we're filling the room with smoke another day. Sib says, perfect refining is for another world. We will battle the sin within us all the days of our lives, anticipating the new heaven and the new earth where sin will be burned away, deep, start again, fresh, new, clothed in purity. I'm not sure if you know the story of Florence Chadwick, She was one of the great long-distance swimmers of the 19th century. She was the first woman to swim the English Channel in both directions. And in 1952, she attempted to swim from Catalina Island to the the coast of California, a distance of 26 miles. And she was 15 hours into that swim when a heavy fog descended and she began to think that she wasn't going to make it. There was a bunch of boats that were surrounding her and supporting her as she swam, and so she stopped and said, i got to get in the boat. And it was only when she was in the boat that she realized she was one mile from shore. But she couldn't see it. The fog had her disoriented and lost, and so she gave up. 
Friends, it doesn't matter what age or stage you are in your Christian journey. We are all swimming in a fog, in a smoke. Smoke caused by sin, ours and others. And it can make it seem like we can't keep going because we can't see where we're going. But this morning, I want to encourage you. Jesus has made us a promise. A smoldering wick I will not snuff out. So don't give up. It's not hopeless at all. The sin within you is part of God's great salvation story. One day we will truly praise God because he has released us from our propensity to do the same hurtful, damaging things over and over again. Florence Chadwick failed just a mile from shore because she couldn't see where she was going. Two months later, she tried again, and the very same thing happened. The the fog descended, she felt disoriented, but she didn't give up, because this time she kept the vision of the shoreline in her mind as she carried on. As we await for Christ's return, We keep his vision in our minds. And we pray, Holy Spirit, come. Come and burn. Burn away all that is unholy in me and make me new in your image. And in the meantime, we give thanks to God every day because he is gentle with us. Though we want to be a bright, pure light in the world, We can't help but produce some smoke along the way. But even so, the little light that we have is a sign of the promise of God who has chosen you to be perfect in his time, by his grace, for his glory. Thanks be to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every more. Our sins, they are many. Would wait as we come.
as he lavished on us. His blood was a payment, his life was the cost. We stood near the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Time to pray. What are you grateful for today? <laughs> Louise. You and Andrew and family. Oh, thank you. Yes, very, very grateful. What else are you grateful for? Rob. Mike. It's not all about you. <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy. <laughs> you want me, <laughs> yeah. I'm not disagreeing with what Louise or Doug is saying, but I'm also grateful for Mike's parents. Uh -huh. uh, through marriage, <laughs> I'm grateful for Andrea's parents parents, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also grateful for the people that are in this church. Yeah, yeah. We got a pretty good thing going on here, don't we? <laughs> what else are you grateful for? Just to be alive. To be alive, It doesn't yeah. seem like much, but it is. It is a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for the trio, absolutely. Yeah. Good. Actually, hey, Graham doesn't have anything on you at all, does he? Graham, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, no more standing ovations for him. <laughs> What's going on in our world that we want to pray about, our wider world? Haiti. What's that, Ted? Slaughter in Gaza, yeah. The, the bird flu that's making its way around, yeah. There are so many on our, our list, and I, I have to say their names quickly, but of course we don't, we don't breeze over them. E each soul is precious to us, and so we, as we think of each individual, we continue to pray for Ed, uh, Caton having had a stroke a couple of weeks ago, and Norma undergoing cancer treatment. Um, we continue to pray for Pat Keene and her healing following a hip surgery. Uh, Barb French, who uh, texted me this morning and said she's, she's got a bit of a viral situation going on, so she's home today, and we continue to pray for her. We continue to pray for Wendy. Uh, we continue to pray for Dick, who's heading to Toronto today, and, uh, and Putty, and as they're thinking about a move and all that's going on in their lives, we just hold them up in our prayers. We pray for young McGregor as he continues to heal from a, a hip surgery. 
our, uh, our dear Reverend Patsy Henry, who had a fall and has surgeries upcoming and whatnot. Uh, continue to pray for David Haynes and his pain in his back. Uh, our dear sister Louise story with a number of health concerns. Uh, we want to pray for our sister Lorraine Martin, who is home today uh, from, uh, from surgery that she had on Friday or home yesterday. And so uh, I hope to pop in uh, on my way home today and see how she's doing. Um, we continue to pray for Fern Sister Marie and her COPD. Uh, some good news, we're going to take Jean Martin off the, the prayer list uh, as she has uh, a long-term care facility looking after her now so we can give thanks to God uh, for his faithfulness. We continue to pray for Dave, uh, Dave's niece, Devon, uh, Mary, uh, Phil's sister, uh, Jamie, uh, awaiting funding for his uh, stem cell treatment, hopefully. Uh, we're continuing to pray for a, a wayward son. Uh, we're going to take Judy's mom, Phyllis, off the list uh, and, uh, uh, because Judy, or Phyllis is doing so well, and uh, she's moving to a long-term care facility as well, and so we give thanks. Uh, we continue to pray for young Lincoln, a boy uh, from the Belleville area fighting a brain tumor, Andrea in Oshawa with cancer treatments, uh, Ralph and Conant. Uh, any update on Ralph? How's he doing? I just went through COVID this year and just found out. <laughs> Long ways to go, okay. Um, we're also playing for Paul and Henny and Julie uh, in their ongoing healing that will come to know the Lord. And uh, Marilyn Fenwick's friend, Janice, uh, undergoing cancer treatments. I want to pray for a young fellow in our congregation, uh, wider congregation, I guess, Kobe, awaiting uh, some surgery. And that family looking for a home uh, continues to be in need, so we continue to pray for them. Um, and Dean Dickerson is going to have uh, cataract surgery this week on Tuesday, so we'll pray for him. That's quite a list. Who else should be on it? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you, humble people who know that we have a sin problem, but we also know that we have a Savior, a Savior who doesn't wait for us to come to Him, but who has come to us in, in Jesus Christ, whose Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts even in this moment, who is renewing us day by day, restoring us to the, the people we were always meant to be, released from the, the bonds of sin and, and evil. And so, Lord, we, we give you thanks for for uh, this ministry that we share. We thank you that Andrea and I are, are here in this place, that our children's ministry downstairs is vibrant, that so many folks feel called to be part of this little thing we have going on here. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of music, especially the music shared with us this morning by, by Louise and Doug and, and Bernice. Lord, we lift up um, the situations around our, our planet <clears throat> where there is war, we hear of Iran attacking Israel. We hear of Haiti. We hear of ongoing death in Gaza. We hear of bird flu. And we hear of devastation in so many other places. Too many to name. But Lord, you have your hand at work in all of those circumstances, and we pray for those who suffer. We pray for our friends in the Anglican parish of Tyendinaga today and pray for your blessing on their, their ministry leaders and upon their gathering this morning. Lord, we continue to pray for our brother Ed, <clears throat> our sister Norma, for Pat and Barb and Wendy, for Dick and Putty, for McGregor and Patsy and, and Dave and Louise. We pray for Lorraine and, and Marie and Jean and Devin and Mary and Jamie, a wayward son. We give you thanks for Phyllis having a, a, a new lease on life as she moves into a new uh, care facility. We, we pray for little Lincoln and for Andrea and Ralph, we pray for Paul and Henny and Julie. We pray for, for Janice and Kobe, for the Martins. We pray for Dean for his surgery on Tuesday. And Lord, we bring our own groanings, our needs, our brokenness to you in this sacred time, and we lift ourselves into your hands. We pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Freely we have received and freely we give. It's now time to honor our, our gifts of many sorts in this congregation. We are so grateful for your generosity. If you'd like to leave an offering this morning, there are containers at the front and at the back on the way out the door. And you can also send an e-transfer. You can send it by mail or you can join our automatic banking option. It comes out of your bank account once a month. You set it up. You can change it whenever you want. Uh, and uh, that's called PAR. And so I offer this simple blessing over all the gifts that we have received to sustain this ministry and to help it flourish. These are the work of your hands and, and uh, uh, the love of our hearts. And may these be a blessing to this community and the wider world in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour. A couple announcements before we head out the door this morning. First of all, John Moore, raise your hand, John, the guy in the yellow right there, Santa Claus, um, is, uh, is our amazing photographer, and he's taken so many good photos over the last year or so, um, but especially during the, the, the camp gala that we had, and John was taking pictures, and a lot of people got posed pictures and whatnot, and he'd, he'd love to send them to the people who he took pictures of, but he doesn't necessarily know how to reach them. So if you had your picture taken, see John. He would love to email you or, or get you a picture uh, so that you can have that. Second of all, uh, Gary Jackson, raise your hand, Gary, is selling tickets for our fish fry, and you better get them quick because they're going fast. Uh, and also Jane has them in the office, so you can call the office, and she will reserve a ticket for you, or, or you can pick it up at any time. And finally, uh, Ed and Norma, we want to bless them. Uh, they're, they're such wonderful uh, folks who have given so much in our community. We want to give them a once-a-week meal from our congregation. And so we have a sign-up le list over here. Some folks that came to me and said, why don't we do something for them? And so I called them and said, what would be helpful? And they said, well, a meal a week would kind of take some pressure off, so that would be wonderful. They, they live south of town, 
kind of down near the power plant uh, near the lake, not too far from that. So it's a bit of a trek down there. So you'll, you'll need to know that in terms of whether you can deliver a meal down there. But that's what we're, that's what we're hoping to do to bless them. So if you're able and willing, we have a sign-up sheet that goes all the way to June. You can take a, take a week and, uh, and sign up to deliver a meal to them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Jessica is willing to do some driving. And it's so, so we, we have some possibilities. So if you ha are able, able to make a meal but you can't drive it there, we can make that work. So call, we'll, we'll work it all through Jane. Jane in the office will be our kind of our go-to on this. Don't talk to me about it because I will... <laughs> I will mess it up. I, I promise you. I will make it more complicated than it needs to be. Jane, talk to, raise your hand, Jane. If you have a question about this... She's the lady. God bless you. God bless every one of you as we head out into this unknown week, but we go with God's blessing and God's presence. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Go now in peace. Amen. I'm greeting at this door today.